started. My name is Karen Sluzer. I work for the University of Virginia Center for Transportation Studies. Um, and we have been running these lunchtime seminars at the request of the Virginia Transportation Research Council, who organized them or asked us to organize them so that they could get their research results out to the field um, and kind of extend the research knowledge and the innovations available, which is today's topic, innovation in the Virginia Department of Transportation. Um, so a few little logistics first. The bathrooms are right outside the door. Everybody can help themselves to a lunch. The white lunch boxes have the food in them, and the green gray lunch boxes are a free gift that you can take with you if you are in person. Um, so we have about 25, we have a full have room scheduled in person, so I would imagine two or three people might come in. And online, we had 80 people registered, so I'm guessing we have about 60 people online if I had to guess. So that is our biggest attendance yet. So this is the seventh one we've done and we've kind of grown. Um, we have, in person, you have evaluations on the table that are on paper. You can fill those out and keep them behind at the end. And our virtual audience, I'm sorry, you know what? My virtual audience can't see me if I'm there. Um, and our virtual audience will get an online uh, evaluation at the end. Um, so then in terms of questions, if you would hold your questions to the end, and what we'll do is we'll alternate questions with the in-person audience and the online audience. And the online audience, you can unmute to ask your question, you can type it in the chat, or you can email Taryn Forrest, who is our online facilitator. Um, and that has usually worked pretty well. So the last thing I wanted to do is introduce our speaker. We have Hari Shripati, who's the director of the Office of Strategic Innovations at VDOT. His office has programs involving data science, digital twins, and he also promotes and champions innovation across all the VDOT. He has a master's degree in civil engineering and is a registered professional engineer in Virginia. And I just learned that he works in this office. I thought you were in Charlottesville and driven up. So I will take it away. Or, okay. Hari will take it away. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Thank you for that introduction. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be here, uh, uh, share a few things uh, regarding innovation. Uh, I will probably go through innovation and how we're defining it. Everybody has a definition. So how we are looking at innovation as a broad portfolio, and then what some of the examples that we have on what innovations that we that is looking at and how we are enabling that culture throughout the organization so it may be helpful to you maybe for you personally or maybe you could take it back to your organization and i hope what i share with you uh, is valuable to you uh, in your personal and professional uh, career as well uh, so I'm just going to go through uh, uh, innovation, right? So when we talk about innovation, anything new and different that you do is innovation by dictionary definition, right? So by that definition, anything we that does to change something, something new, that's innovation. So when we look at we dot. We have 60,000 miles of roads to maintain and operate. And every day, you know, we are spending our annual budget is about $7 billion, I think, last I checked. We have 7,700 employees and 250 offices across the state. You know, if you combine all the area headquarters, residencies, districts, a lot of field offices, everything combined, approximately maybe 225 to 250 offices, people spread across the Commonwealth, every corner of the Commonwealth. So if somebody does something new and different, they learn how do we use that and spread that across the agency and take advantage of that innovation or new idea. That's something we are looking at. Also, when you look at innovation, we're all, you know, transportation engineers or businesses, transportation, but at the same time, we're also a business, right? So we have to run, like I said, 7,700 employees or $7 billion a year. We're spending, there is that business side of that we need to look at. So there are transportation innovations that citizens experience is one bucket that we put in. How we run the agency, what we do, how we do it, are there better methods, better processes, better technologies that we can adapt that would allow us to be more efficient 
in delivering those new innovations to the citizens. So we looked at a lot of models. And so when you look at innovation, uh, you have, you know, do we have the capability or not? There is that scale that you see in horizontal axis. Vertical axis is novelty of that new innovation or new idea that we get. So if you look at that from that scale, there are some things that we have already used. We have the capability, but we're not using in other areas. We have one area using something, not the other area. <clears throat> To me, those are what we are calling that for this purpose of core innovation. And things that are new, new capabilities that we need to acquire, or the disruption or the novelty is too big, that's going to impact the entire agency. Those will call them transformational innovation. So we need to begin to make sense out of this word innovation and start putting them in buckets to deal with appropriately. So that's what we have done, and looking at this, uh, the whole agency, what we did. And so the next question that comes to mind is, why are we talking about innovation? What are we doing now that should be changed? Or why we should change? Or why should we innovate? If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So some people say that. We all heard that in our professional career somewhere. To me, there are various reasons. It's not just you wait until it's broke before you fix it. You have an opportunity, especially as a VDOT, stewards of public dollars that we get, and we do maintain those. And so it, it's not upon us to prevent a problem. If you can prevent a problem, that's better than letting that happen. I mean, every you know, fire departments have fire marshals going out and preventing fires or checking the smoke detectors, right? Educating people. So it's not about putting out fire solving problems, but we need to prevent problems. The other one is continuous improvement. We always have the opportunity to improve ourselves, no matter where we are in that spectrum. We always have an opportunity to improve ourselves continuously. And fourth item is that creating a new future. That's more important now than ever before with the changes in technology. A couple of years ago, when you talk about AI, probably people would have rolled their eyes and not even talked about it. But today, thanks to chat GPT, every single person talks about AI in some fashion, right? So the technology is evolving so rapidly, the expectations are changing. So we need to get ahead and start thinking about that new future in the transportation world. The other way to look at that is when you look at improving, continuous improvement or creating that new future, another reason why is you have to be able to do things cheaper, faster, better, safer every day. If you did the same thing that you did last year, I'm not sure that's good enough anymore. In the society, the way it's evolving. So you always have to adapt to the society that's evolving around us. And so from that perspective, each and every one of us have the opportunity to do things cheaper, faster, better, and safer in one of those things every single day when we come to work. And we all have some responsibility towards doing some dull, dangerous, dirty work. That's a fact of life, right? So when we come to work, whether you are a field employee, office employee, you're doing some of that. So you have 10 things to do when we don't, you come to work, you can only do five things. You have the time to do five things. And so what do you do? You have to automate certain things. So where do you start automating things? Well, if you are sitting there entering information in a spreadsheet all day long, that's a dull work. We need to automate that. There are some dangerous work, dirty work that we do. There is an opportunity to automate. So we're looking at what things that we have that we can automate. So when you talk about innovation, there are certain things that are key. 
that curiosity somewhere along the way when we were kids we were curious about everything why is that what is that and somewhere along the way we lose that curiosity so because we do something somebody slap on our wrist and maybe we just follow the standards and books and apply that every single day as engineers were drilled into our minds you have to follow the standards and so processes and procedures if that's all we do then how do we improve ourselves? There is that room that we need to create for our staff to have that space and the time. And I'll talk about next, manage the risk and to create that opportunity to do things. And so these are some of the ingredients that in my mind that are needed to develop some new innovative solutions or adopting them. You don't have to come up with everything new collaboration, some of these things are important. There are some lots of methods. If you do research on how to improve an idea uh, rapidly, there is a method and there is 635 method. We've adapted a few of those methods to really take an idea. Somebody says, yeah, what can we, what do you think about this? Well, let's look at that. So, you know, for example, rapid idea improvement method is the person presents an idea or a solution. The other member of the team takes that idea, says what's good about it, lifts them up. The other one will play the role of a sponsor. One more member of the team play the role of customer and critique that from their own pers that, that perspective, not from that person's perspective, but put themselves in the either customer or a sponsor that says, why do I need to invest money in this idea, right? So then you take it all that develop and so something like 635 method, I found this very you know useful. You put six people, multidisciplinary team of people, which could not be innovation, any kind of problem solving, put six people to the, at a table and give them each sheet of paper, ask them to write, three solutions for each of the problem you identify. And then ask them to rotate that, hand it off to the next person sitting and that goes through the rotation of the table. So remaining five people will improve that idea that's written on the sheet of paper, right? So by the time you're done, you have 18 ideas that are you know, gone through that circulation of five other people improving it you're going to find something or a combination of those. And so there are, you can go through, Google it, YouTube it, you can find so many of these methods and in innovation than improving the ideas or coming up with ideas. And some of these, so I'll bring that back to the transportation world now. If you look at, you know, previously we used to have just roads and highways, and now we have various transportation options and they are continuing to grow. So we all know that, so we don't have to go through. Then the technology on the other hand is rapidly improving. I mean, today is, you know, much faster than yesterday. So if you look at that, uh, the way things are um, evolving, uh, you have various technologies evolving from, you know, in the society, not only the transportation end to, you know, payment technology, communications, by the time you turn around, there's a new, you know, now, you know, SpaceX has the Starlink technology. Well, a few years ago, it was not there and you're in a remote area. So things like that, every day, come, people are developing and at a rapid pace. And we need to understand all of those and try to adapt those in our own thinking and evolve. And as a, you know, social media, well, 10 years ago, if you talk about social media, probably very few people even understood or used it, but today people cannot live without, right? So, and a lot of this customer interaction, no matter who you are, you know, I no longer call the customer service center anymore for any of my personal use. If I have an issue with Verizon, I go to on a Sunday afternoon or Sunday night and open up their chat bot and chat with the bot. That works for me because I don't have to pick up the phone and stay on the phone for one hour for before they connect me. And the way the technology is being deployed, these chat bots have live agents behind them. 
So the chat bar answers a few questions and then it becomes a difficult hour when you say, I want to talk to an agent, they'll connect you to an agent. And you are chatting with an agent immediately. So to me, those kinds of omni-channel interactions of customers, whether you have websites, emails, you know, 1-800 numbers, and social media, or chatbots, all of these things are really, you know, there. So we need to learn to adapt and use and in our own customer interactions and customer service. So when you when we start looking at all of this, it's, man, that's a lot of change. So what can we learn? Is there some, are there some lessons we can learn from the past that we can apply to what we are looking at in Redon? So if you look at the cash, I'm sure some of you may not have any cash in your pocket, but most of you probably have some cash, right? The cash didn't disappear. Bank as a building did not disappear just because somebody invented an ATM or a credit card. Yeah, banks probably are less used today, but if I still, if I go to a bank today on a Saturday for something, people are lining up and they have to get a number in some of these banks still, right? And a few years ago, when I started first started the profession, people said, ah, oh, you're a traffic engineer, you're in the wrong business because people are going to email and nobody's going to drive anymore, you're entering the dying business, right? But today you look at that, all the FedEx, UPS, emails, post offices are still there. So some things will change, but don't go away. We still have to provide those core services. From VDOT perspective, we still have to maintain the roads and bridges and all that stuff. That's not going away. All this technology, anything else that we do is change what we do, how we do it, but some things don't go away. Some things evolve. So if you look at the phone, every decade there is a major shift. And the landline to invention of the cell phone, then the cell phone to kind of, you know, smartphone, you know, Apple phone one to 10. A huge 10 year period, smartphone industry, Apple one to Apple 10, the apps, devices, the network, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, now people are talking about 6G networks, right? So everything evolved. If you think about that entire global network of cell towers, fiber connectivity and all of that made that happen. Apps evolved at their own pace, network evolved, and devices evolved. So we need to evolve without people even knowing about it. So how much you know, how these things evolve. You know, it's like watching a tree grow. You don't know. So if, if you look at it day to day, but these things evolve, and we need to continue to evolve and change. And some things are paradigm shift items, right? So if you look at NASA, the space shuttle program, they scrapped and shifted to rockets and SpaceX. When NASA was building rockets, it was $800 million to build that rocket in probably a decade or two decades for them to develop one. SpaceX came into the market and said, we can do this for $50 million. They laughed at, it's a lot of people, but they get the contract and they delivered that at $80 million. Yes, it's over the budget, but Compared to 800 million, NASA was spending, SpaceX did that for $80 million. And now they're developing reusable rockets every day, putting Starlink satellites in, in space. So a lot of these are paradigm shifts that we need to evolve. But all of that comes to the risk, especially as a government agency, we need to manage the risk. So Anything that we look at, we put them in those four quadrants, right? So a lot of you are familiar with Gartner quadrants, and this is, you know, risk reward quadrant. And, you know, some of these high risk and low return, yeah, money pits, we're not touching those. Lots of ideas every day. I get so many ideas from so many companies and say, we have this, we want to do that, or we our employees, and we evaluate and quickly look at that, which quadrant it belongs. And so some of these, yeah, low risk, low return, low hanging fruits. We just let people try it out. Those high risk, high return, we manage them. 
properly across the state because that's a high risk and also return is high if you are successful. So we need to manage those carefully. Low risk, high returns. Those are the quick wins. We can, you know, we partner with people. So when we look at the innovation, there are various ways we are enabling that in the agency. Some of them we just monitor. Some of them we enable others. Some of them we partner with. Some of them we manage. So what are some of the transformational innovations? And so I want to touch quickly, you know, everybody's talking about AI. Well, there are lots of AI applications. A lot of people are fearful of. I don't know how many of you watched 60 Minutes episode recently. There's an AI 60 Minutes episode. They interviewed Google CEO and president of Microsoft. And an analogy they used for AI is like nuclear energy. So you can build an atomic bomb. That's a separate thing. It's a country's control. That's general AI, general intelligence that can do many things. That's going to be more control. We're nowhere near that at this point. You know, but you can look at the same way nuclear energy is being used in power production. And when I go to my doctor's office for a test, they use nuclear medicine. There is a whole thing every day being used. And we do nuclear gauges and various things in many industries, right? So same way there are narrower applications in transportation and business that we can use and they do limited things and we can develop and implement and test them out. Whereas kind of not worried about this big bad AI. So that's what we're looking at. So a lot of these things without us knowing we're using Google translation or facial recognition. When you look at your Google photos, you click on a photo, you can you know, sort out all the photos of that person that's ever in and 100,000 photos, right? So a lot of these language processing models, sentiment analysis, speech recognition, it's all there. And we're all using that. Chat GPT is a small portion of it. We're not there yet to start looking at that. Our information technology agency is evaluating some of that. And we will probably at some point use it. But at this point, we are focused on what we can do in transportation application and what business applications that we can use. Again, those two buckets that we need to be looking at. So I'll just quickly touch upon machine learning, which is a subset of AI. And in that, there are kind of unsupervised learning and supervised learning. We are looking at those two ends. Uh, at this point, we haven't gotten any robots yet, and we're not training any robots in VDOT. Uh, we're just barely looking at what's available in the market uh, in terms of navigation of devices and stuff. But if you look at unsupervised learning, that's more big data visualization, cluster analysis, that kind of stuff. We are looking at that and say, okay, we have all this crash data, all these various data sets, how we can cluster them, look at the patterns and stuff. And supervised learning is where you have a target. We look at, okay, if you have something, you know, what, you know, uh, to like how the pavements are deteriorating, for example. At the end, we could CCI rating is the target, and then you could look at all the factors that are contributing to that deterioration, for example. You can apply that to crash prediction, say, okay, crash is the outcome. There are 100 different variables that contribute to that, which one of those variables are predominantly correlating to that type of crash. That type of regression analysis, the future predictions. Okay, if this is, then next time, these types of weather, these kind of traffic volumes, these kind of free speeds come together, it, what is the risk for crash on that segment of the road compared to the others? So these are some of the opportunities we are exploring using AI and ML. And some of these are already in place and in use that many people may or may not be aware of, like tolling systems, those license plate recognition systems that are used in the tolling every single day, every toll road uses it. Those are all 
machine learning. They, you know, if you think about 50 states, license plates, each one has hundreds of variations of license plates, letters, colors. You should be able to recognize that license plate with the photo taken in a vehicle traveling at 70 miles per hour. That is, there is an AI algorithm trained model. They train various license plates from each state, build the model and apply that. So it's there. We're using it on many of the toll facilities in Virginia and every other state is using it. And that's based on computer vision. So some of these other various companies out there in the marketplace, we're evaluating like, you know, uh, incident detection, kind of maybe near miss type of thing or tracking vehicle patterns and uh, flow analysis, various things that you could do using machine learning. And the prediction piece that I talked about is being used again, incident predictions in various agencies across the country or testing various models and congestion predictions. Um, if you look at Google Maps, I mean, that's all built on AI navigation systems and giving you directions, right? And I already talked about acid deterioration, road condition monitoring. I could think of the at least 20 companies are out there in the market looking at uh, asset condition detection, uh, looking at images or video, LIDAR, they can identify the asset, they identify the asset condition, give you that information. There's a lot of companies out there doing the parking management, parking detection. Already there, we're looking at that as well. And a lot of the pedestrian detection, you know, passive detection, pedestrian at the intersection without pushing the button, you can activate or you can do various things. And of course, AVs are fully developed using the um, AI technology. Um, first, the big project we have using the technology, we are doing a lot of smaller pilots and various things. You might have heard this RM3P, which is regional multimodal mobility program. It started in Northern Virginia, expanded that to Fredericksburg region through a federal grant where we collected all the data from various jurisdictions and modes of transportation, combined them into one data exchange platform where you think about 20 agencies trying to share their data with 20 companies trying to do business. It's just not going to happen there. Everybody has to sign an agreement and all of that stuff. So this data exchange platform um, collects all that information, which we have completed already. And the goal is to improve safety, reliability, and mobility through that multimodal coordination. There is an AI decision support system that we just received the CTB or Commonwealth Transportation Board approval last week. So we'll be executing that contract soon. That contract has, again, some of the congestion predictions and crash predictions and response plans and you know, multimodal. All the agencies, how they could respond together, what's the best response plan. And so looking at the current conditions and the past condition, how we responded to the system will recommend an optimal response plan to large scale incidents in the region. So there is an AI based compute, commuter parking system under procurement right now. So I don't want to talk too much about that. And also a dynamic incentivization, which is under procurement as well. Using that data, some of this information to influence that driver behavior in real time. So we do have a lot of traditional TDMs already in the region. What this does is take that, put that in steroids and very targeted percentage of folks that we could try to influence in real time when that major incident happens. So enough people would go back home or not take the trip or go to nearby Starbucks, spend an hour, maybe they get a coupon as an incentive for doing that. We're going to work that out. It's our goal is to make that a long-term sustainable program instead of government funding it. So we have a little bit of seed money to get that started. And we will see what that procurement um, results and how we can sustain that dynamic incentivization. And 
Some of these other technologies, LiDAR is the, another big technology transforming our business. Uh, if you look at our you know, iPhone 13s, I think Pros, iPhone 12 Pros have LiDAR in them, but they are very limited to indoor use or small scale use, but they are there and they're going to get better every year. I'm sure with Apple, anytime they bring something to the market, there are so many apps in the marketplace right now to use the LiDAR data from your iPhone. And to do this. if you look at that picture with a pole, that's not the real pole that's there. One of our folks took that scan of that pole and dropped it in on that in that area next to the curb to demonstrate how that would look. I mean, if you go to the public meeting or go to your client and say, hey, I'm going to put a pole here. This is how it's going to look like at this location. That's the type of pole and that's the type of foundation sticking out next to that curb. That's powerful. And I don't think we are using that widely enough. So those of you in the room have the opportunity to start using it. I would encourage you to start looking at that technology and start using it. If you look at the right side picture, the cabinet, signal cabinet on the right side is real. The left side is the virtual reality one. <laughs> so we just scanned it, dropped it next to it. But if you look at the perspective view of it, everything, including the shadow of that it modified to fit that location. That powerful is your smartphone or an iPad that's in your hand. This was done about a year or two ago. Now, you probably, if I use today's examples, they probably blow your mind. So there are lots of opportunities in the industry that we need to take advantage of. And the other big advancement that cross-cutting across the agency, we're tracking and looking and see how we can implement and improve is the virtual reality. The lot of what I'm going to talk about today is it's applicable across the agency because I can talk about the bridge or pavement or any one of the dot innovations, what's happening there will be here for the next you know 10 hours. And so I want to kind of limit today's conversation to kind of broader technologies and broader use of the uh, innovations. And so if you look at this, that's one of them is in Salem, one of them is in Bristol. We have done it as a pilot and using the current technology that we have, right? So VDOT has licenses to MicroStation, open road design, you know, context capture, a lot of Bentley products that we use. We used what we have. We didn't go after buying anything new or no spend, didn't spend any money other than what we used our staff time for. I could play the video later on if you're interested. Uh, but yeah, so the actual virtual reality, you sit in the driver's view, you can drive through that roundabout or displaced left turn to take that to the, you know, the car or citizen information meeting. Let people drive through the area or look at that Pulse Field Expressway option five and they did that, you can see how that looks. So a lot of opportunities are there. You can post those 360 degree videos on YouTube and post on the website for people to look at all around. You know, all that stuff is there and you can take it to the citizen meeting and put virtual reality goggles on their face and they can actually experience sitting in the car driving through that proposed roadway. And this is again an example from Salem where they were building the pedestrian bridge and the parking lot. They proposed two options, steel and concrete stairs. And they developed that model and let citizens view it and express their opinion on which one they want. That's very powerful. And you see the left side, the people standing on, you can actually uh, put on VR goggles, walk on the bridge and look at the bridge from various perspectives and provide your you know, comments on instead of just putting in a two dimensional plan sheet in front of them to uh, ask for their opinion, right? So this is, again, some of these things cost, you know, people that learn how to do it, they tell me they could do it in, 30 hours, 40 hours of time. We're not talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
Yeah, I think Todd, I've already mentioned that uh, you know, asset rendition using images. Uh, we are looking at that, um, like in this example, our in-house team tested it for rumble strips to see if we can detect it. And so before we go out and you know get the data, trust the vendors that are trying to sell us stuff, and uh, we did a proof of concept to see if this is real. Yes, it is. I mean, the model, in our case, we didn't even fine tune, but let's say it's 87% confident that's a rumble strip there in that image. So we could get asset inventory and it works. That that does is that allows us to make data driven decisions and maintenance or to do preventive maintenance and some of these things. And so, and we can run a lot of that type of forecasting and predictions using the data. That brings me to the next thing, the BIM process. A lot of design engineers are looking at across the country, uh, building information model, 3D, 4D, 5D based, model based design and construction. VDOT is also looking at that. But that's going to be you know, limited the whole industry, you need to develop around the construction folks, as well as um, all the design engineers and VDOT and the claims process, if you would administer the whole thing in a 3D environment and attach schedule and the budget to it, it makes it 4D, 5D. It's gonna be a long process, but we are looking at that, what we did with the 3D models is the initial step. But the bigger powerful aspect is taking all of the data, making that available to subsequent phases, which is maintenance and operations. So we're trying to figure that out, what we call the digital twin is the framework. It's been used by aircraft industry for aircraft engines to airports, to oil refineries, various places that run 24 seven. It's important to maintain while running and the, each component has a major impact if you don't replace it. They're looking at that. So we're looking at that as well as in a transformational innovation over the next decade or so it's not gonna to happen tomorrow. But as we collect more asset information on the asset side, inventory, condition, in an automated way. And then we have all these, you know, in analysis software like Power BI or all the other tools that we have, combine that with predictive piece on AI and ML. That's where we see a great opportunity to connect the data, create a digital replica of our physical assets. That's the essentially what the digital twin is. And so then once you create that digital replica of our physical asset, that allows you to move the data from the design world to maintenance and operations world without recreating it. Right now, when we design the project, we create the you know the PDF files or TIFF files of those plan sheets and hand them over to construction. They do their own construction management software, annotate stuff and PDF their forms, and then at the end, box them up. And in the maintenance world, well, they start all over again. So this is where uh, we would like to go next uh, in terms of the, oh, what happened? Computer got stuck, okay, sorry. So this is where we'll be going. This is what I'm talking about in a digital twin world. What is it? It's a digital realistic dynamic representation. It's not just a 3D model. What makes the digital twin it is, is adding that real-time data. We have lots of operational data from INRIX to many traffic sensors. We get real-time data every second, every minute, every five minutes, every hour, every day, depending on what type of data it is, and asset conditions. Right now, asset information is not tied to operational, not tied to financial. So this digital twin in the future where Everything is tied, allowing us to do what if scenarios and simulations. What if you do this? If I, or what's the cost? Or you know, how long this is like? If I failed the thing here, how many other things that same thing I have in my inventory that I need to plan to replace ahead of their actual failing? So a lot of that uh, is something we are thinking through to bring together the data 
the analytics piece, predictions piece, visualization piece, and the asset and real-time data, operational data, all kinds of other data together. So we are developing a proof of concept for using our maintenance data to begin with, and we're looking at all the others. And so that's where the big transformational stuff is happening. And then I'll quickly go through when we talk about the core innovation, I'll give you some examples. You know, you have, when I say 7,700 employees, a lot of ideas are out there. Everybody has an idea. We cannot chase after every single thing. So, and so you have to have a methodical process to do that. That's where we're promoting kind of an orderly process and to go through all the ideas and put them in a bucket and others will improve the ideas and then we do a pilot, a proof of concept. And only after we learn from it, the successful, then we would jump to the actual full-blown implementation. So there are ways we are uh, engaging our employee. Uh, so we have a crowdsourcing platform called Idea Driver. That's our brand. That's a private company, Idea Scale. We is a software company that we use for that. That allows people to vote on, you know, develop those ideas further. And then also our 1-800-FOR-ROAD, our customer service center, could take the calls from our internal VDOT employees to solicit ideas and say somebody has an idea driving in the field, they don't have time to enter in the system or they don't have field employees, don't have easy access to the system, they could call that number. So we are crowdsourcing all of those ideas. And we created a tool shed in what we call innovation tools at all various tools, methods, processes that we have in one place on our intranet side. And also, um, uh, I'll quickly run through some of these. Um, we have, you know, we call innovation labs where a diverse group of people, we bring them together, give them a problem to solve, they work through in, in uh, and identify opportunities and solutions. Uh, we do that by district, by we've been doing that now by district by district, because each district has unique problems that they face. We want to kind of get close to where the employees are. And we're taking this year a further step down to area headquarters level where our maintenance folks are to have engaging conversations with them one-on-one -on -one to see what problems they're facing or in the field and what solutions they have in mind that if not everything has to come from top down they have an idea because they are the ones that are every day out there doing the work people that are doing the work are the best people to tell you if something needs to change or something that would help them so we're engaging them and we kind of created a playbook from that first one we did and we want to fine tune that a little bit and try to implement that across the state as well. So there are various ways. We have a monthly webinar that we do, sharing all kinds of technical presentations to tools and various things that are happening in the agency. So everybody else in the agency are aware of it. So they could say, oh, I could adapt that or I could do that. Uh, we did a catalog recently with all kinds of stuff that we found in the last couple of years that were done in VDOT, and it was distributed across the state to our employee news, to everybody. Um, uh, some of these ideas that were implemented, so just they can draw inspiration from and look at that and say innovation is not those big transformational thing, or it, it is in everybody's hands, innovation is everybody's business, just like safety, it's a culture, it's the behavior. And so we are also, we have lots of statewide working groups and relate to all the district maintenance engineers or design engineers, they come together, talk about their problems. Some of these technologies that we use are cutting across, like I said, like GIS, it is in maintenance, it's in design, it's in construction, it's everywhere. So we created an opportunity for folks to come together, what we call communities of practice on MS teams once a month, they come together and uh, they, they come together and talk about somebody will present 
share ideas. We have an MS team such people can ask questions, learn from others. The other big thing that we have done is low code, no code based on Microsoft Power Apps. Enable that our business and we created that business enablement team and they uh, and established a process where we our employees can build their own apps using the Microsoft Power Platform. If they're collecting a lot of data in the field, they can quickly build an app using Survey123 or Power Apps Platform, go to the field, collect the data, and it's all there. A lot of paper-based forms that Vida was using before were all being eliminated slowly. People are building these apps to collect a lot of that data and that allows us to analyze the data. A lot of paper, fill, you know, people fill out, put them somewhere, is not going to help. And anyone can join with their manager's approval and could go learn. And then robotic process automation, a couple of years ago, we brought that and mentioned the example of somebody is entering invoices, coming in in a PDF form and entering that into a financial management system. Now we use a Blue Prism bot, somebody program the bot to take all these invoices that come in and enter that into our financial management system. So the person could just wait. It takes 15 minutes for somebody to enter. The bot could enter in five minutes and the person can watch and supervise to make sure all the data is being entered correct way. And there are more and more of those chatbots and various things uh, that you can use and automate various things using some of the tools we already have. We don't have to go get something new. A lot of Power BI dashboards and analytics being built every single day. That's a huge thing in VDOT. And anyway, you know, a lot of people are using some of those business intelligence platforms. And so some of these things, we're going to have, you know, all the contract documents are now being used, DocuSign to, there is a whole community of practice on that. So most of you that probably signed contracts going forward, probably start getting those doctor signed stuff. So anyway, so those are some of those big items and they were getting close to the end. And when I have a lot more examples, I could, you know, go through, but let me see, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, some of these examples, like you know, Hampton Roads, they use sonar, small one, big boats, robots, and you know, one of our innovation labs, somebody came up with this idea to say, hey, why are we not using battery operated chainsaws that allows us battery operated equipment with less exposures to fumes and we can continue to work on core orange days, various things that came out, came out a couple of years ago. Again, during COVID, somebody came up with this idea of building the app to locate the field crews in remote areas where there is no cell coverage to really know the contact. Some of these examples, we have emergency alert systems so that we use to notify people to report to the snow duty instead of calling one by one. We have an internal 3D printer that we used. Uh, this is an example where we printed a chainsaw tube using a 3D printer, a big replica of the small, tiny chainsaw to train people on how to sharpen it, or the proper way to sharpen the chainsaw, for example. So visual aid, the various things related to 3D printing. You know, Cradle Point is a mobile Wi-Fi. We deployed that to a lot of our field crews trucks that our field people have a Wi-Fi access, it's dual SIM. So both if you're in an AT&T phone or you know, Verizon, wherever the area has a better coverage in the state that they could get Wi-Fi, they can connect their laptops in the field and we will do that. So some of these things we are showcasing a lot of that around the state in the district offices, opportunities come to the biggest thing is to showcase some of these others and see and learn from uh, what we're doing and others are doing across the state. It's not something, like I said, me or our office doing everything. It's the people in VDOT that are doing it. We're enabling them to do a lot of this stuff. So I'll stop there, pause for any questions. And I know I've been through a lot of stuff related to that uh, innovation. We'll do a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll start with the uh, in-person audience for any questions. 
Hang on a second. Deepak, please. Hmm? So, what about the drone technology for inspections um, and safety? Mm -hmm. Yep, we do have a drone program, but we have decided not to own the drones ourselves or operate the drones. And we have a lot of contracts that we use for various purposes. And so people are already using drones for various purposes in Vida for their own um, use cases in construction and communications in various design, various areas. And for inspections, I don't think we're there yet. And so that's our bridge division is looking at that. And, but I don't think we are there yet for the bridge inspections. Uh, um, they will probably uh, uh, you know, get there someday, but there are some issues related to meeting the federal requirements that current drone technology won't allow them to you know, inspect the way that federal requirements require them to sound out the bridge and hitting with the hammer. There are certain requirements. The current drone tech people are saying they're using it, but they use it, but not for you know fully, to my knowledge, in a way that um, it, it cannot replace the inspection program we currently have. So then for our remote audience, I was just going to switch yeah. to the remote audience. Uh, you can unmute and speak, or you can type in the chat, um, or you Let's can see. contact uh, Taryn, our facilitator. Uh, so <laughs> I just saw one of the online people asked if they could have the lunchtime swag too. Um, so I don't know if you want to scroll all the way down and we can see if any questions, but Taryn will also be monitoring. Taryn, have we had any questions typed into the chat? Yes, Lauren has a question. Hi there. I was wondering if you could tell me what's the most innovative thing that you've ever seen in a trail or other active transportation development? In a trail uh, or active? active transportation? Again, mm -hmm. pedestrian bike detection is probably an area to look at. And again, a lot of general stuff is applicable to trails as well when you look at the asset conditions and stuff like that, collecting the video and analyze it. They're applicable to trails and maybe trail crossings where you can probably look at passive detections and various things that uh, I've seen people experiment with. The company is building technologies for the trail crossing major highways or uh, things like that to, for detecting purposes. I don't know if you have some application in mind with that question that we should be looking at. We'll be more than happy to look at and talk to you about it. Thank you. That's that's great for today. Appreciate that. Yep. In person, if you have a question. Go ahead. <clears throat> we have a local, a local chat public We don't have that. We have been thinking about it, but we don't have any plan to. I guess the, for online audience, the question is: Is there? a plan to use chat GPT for training the manuals and the no, answer. No, that's not the, the my idea is by the local thing. Yeah. More than not the chat GPT. Yeah, but it's a local aid getting something again, developing something to train a model that could go through the manuals and our standard books and spec books and all you do is ask a question in general english it can point you in the right direction yes somebody raised that thing as an option for us to look at we are i'm aware of it but i don't think we have any official program or a plan to do that that's one of those things again we need to find the time to do it and if at all we're going to do something like that that may be one of the early use cases or early adopters for that type of technology. And online, do we have some more online, another online question? Hi, Karen, yes, we do have one. Um, we have a question that says, are there any ongoing innovation projects focusing on public transportation? Uh, 
Yes, but those are from our sister agency, Department of Rail and Public Transportation. I don't want to speak for them, and they do have some programs that are funded through our ITTF funding program called, you know, that's a innovative transportation technology fund that we have for that Commonwealth Transportation Board funds. And there are a few projects in there related to bus technology. They have done a pilot with mobile eye in detecting the pedestrians and bicyclists around the bus. And I think blind spot warning. There are certain things that they are doing related to bus technology. And maybe I think uh, if you contact them, they'll be in a better position to give you more accurate information and more latest information. Uh, to me, that that's where I think they have done, if I remember correctly, a procurement for all the um, local bus agencies to use. And so there are some innovative things that they're doing. That's our in-person audience. What's the best way for private industry to help contribute to EDOT's innovation? Bringing the ideas in every opportunity you get, right? So then it doesn't have to be a separate innovation. It could be part of what you do and propose a solution, innovative solution. If you're responding to an RFP from VDOT or you're participating in a roadway design, if there is a better way to solve the problem or you know improving the way we do things, and they're all welcome. And so we need to be able to do that. So some things that you know, we could look at, give me a call. We could talk about that. If you have something where it's applicable to you know, agency across or the industry itself need to change. And so there are ways we can work through the industry organizations, for example, the ASHI or ASHTO or ITA, various, you know, ITS America, various societies you can work through to or individually one on one. And you could sit down with us if you have a, you know, an idea or a solution. I'll be more than happy to be the point of contact and find the right people in the agency. I do get a lot of phone calls and emails from people in the industry. I may not have all the information on everything, but I will usually connect them or participate in a meeting with somebody from that subject matter expertise to have that dialogue and to see what the what we can adopt. You know, sometimes we do get, you know, do, you, do we have, we need to, we're trying to match where you know, somebody has a better, better mousetrap, we need to match that to where the most problem is, right? Mm -hmm. So just because they have something people bring in, we may not be able to adapt that right away, but if we're aware of it somewhere, we find some other problem and say, oh, maybe they, this may be the solution for that. So we try to connect the dots as well. Sometimes we may not be able to use something today, but if we're aware of it, it may be useful tomorrow or day after. So I think we have time for one more uh, uh, online question and maybe one more in-person question, maybe. <laughs> so another online question. Don't see any at this time, Karen. Okay. Any more in person? I was just going to make a comment. When you did talked about um, the virtual uh, virtual 3D for public engagement, that was actually one of the topics of our first lunch and learn in April was about uh, using virtual methods, particularly like Zoom, you know, things that were at the start of the pandemic to increase public engagement. But that has sort of some inherent interest to the general public who might be like, oh, I can visualize this, you know, or this is some cool thing. Like, so it has maybe the potential to increase engagement simply for the, the novelty factor. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then so be a better, a better information given as well. Okay. All right. Nice. Well, thank you very much for our in-person and our remote audience. We'd like to end on time since it's your lunch lunch break. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for coming. Another round of applause. Thank you, Karen.